welcome back to episode 3 of Capital Interns. Our podcast essentially aids those high school or first or second year students who are lost in choosing or paving their career paths. Unlike other podcasts, we focus on our guests' passions, post-secondary life, and personal experiences rather than just work experience. And now I'll pass it on to Rufi. Today's guest is quite unique. She is a third year student in kinesiology at Queen's University. She is currently working at not one, but two part-time research assistant positions. She loves being in tune with nature, connecting with people, and passionate about learning. One of her most exciting products right now include her permaculture garden that she is growing right now, and her new business initiative as well. But before discovering these things about herself, she has dealt with chronic pain and learned how to become a more selfless person. This is the story of Lucy Lee, trying to fit from a perfect mold of society to realizing that ain't it. Please welcome Lucy Lee to the podcast. Hello guys, thank you so much for having me. On today's episode, we're going to talk about her reasons for choosing kinesiology, the impact of her high school experience, and the renewed views on her life. So Lucy, um, thank you for coming on today. So what exactly is kinesiology and what do you what did you learn about it? So kinesiology is the study of the human body in a biological, individual health, community health, and sociological health context um, in the sense of anatomy, physiology, but you also learn about individual behavior. So how active people um, come to be active versus non-active, sedentary people who, you know, sit on the couch all day instead of deciding to go out for a walk. In terms of community health, you kind of learn about individuals health of different groups affect each other and societal health is kind of like community health but on an even bigger level so a community could be a city or a school of a society would be a country or the whole entire world and in kinesiology you can take many many streams a lot of people do the sports side medical side um, population health side you could even throw in uh, the environment you know therapy rehab all of that stuff what stream are you in so you don't exactly pick your stream in my program at least but there are many things you can add on to tailor your experience yourself right now i'm in the athletic therapy mini stream program which means i get to work with varsity athletes on their teams to help with injury prevention and healing all that stuff and i'm in the aging and disability certificate, which means I get to work with people with mental and physical disabilities, help them in their life, learn about how disabilities affect health in the individual and societal context. And I'm in the research mainstream, so that means I'm doing research and obviously you can go many routes with that, but I'm actually really, really interested in geology, geology. and geography. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and so I really want to add in. Rocks, landforms, all of that stuff I find fascinating. I really, really enjoy the concept of how different landforms um, affect the way we move and interact with the world and how like different landforms affect our health, whether that's the urban or natural built environment. So I want to add in a lot of geo courses. Rock on. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know there was a correlation between um, the earth moving and us. That's kind of cool. Tell us about it. What kind of courses are you taking? Um, so, like, there's no exact tailored um, program for that specifically, just something that I'm interested in. But there is this one course called uh, something something bio... I think it's called biogeography. Um, or some something like bio and geography mushed together. And basically that talks about how landforms affect different biological systems and how, for example, like depending on if you're on a rocky area or a watery area, how life changes and how ecological system changes. Yeah, I find that really exciting because we are a part of the ecological system and obviously like how the world exists and positions itself, we position ourselves uh, in relation to that. So we tend to live near water and not in the middle of a desert, you know? Wait, Lucy, I have a really serious question. It's super serious. Yeah. It's super, super serious. Okay? Oh, yeah. Am I going to rock right. on? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that. Do you do you think that the Earth is flat? Oh, well, you know, I think uh, many people have their personal opinions, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes 
opinions might not be correct, but who knows? Opinions aren't facts. That's 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 what it is. <laughs> Damn it! I'm the outcast. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But in terms of kinesiology, what sort of courses do you take in it? So in first year, it depends on the program. But for my program, we had two electives, and the rest were mandatory courses. For my electives, I took biology and chemistry, um, and my uh, mandatory courses were psychology, the socio-cultural uh, context of sports and physical activity, which I personally enjoyed.、Uh, we took health 101, which was The sociocultural determinants of health. So that means like things that determine your health outside of the realm of diseases and cancer and things like that, but rather poverty and environmental crisis. And I took physiology 101, so like very basic basic physiology. Yeah, courses like that. Courses you would assume. That sounds actually really cool. I wouldn't have assumed because I'm not in kinesiology, but this sounds super fun. Where are you working right now? So right now I'm working with、uh, the Breer Hospital, which is a complex of hospitals that take in patients with really complex needs, often complex and chronic, because they need you know special and extra support. And within this hospital, there's this new pilot program right now called、um, Artists in Residence.、Uh, in short, we call it the AIR program or AIR. And within this program, because it's so new and because it's really different from programs that are usually in the hospitals, we're doing a quality improvement or quality assessment study to see how it's impacting the patients and the community members. Because it's focused around community art and collective art, and、um, looking at how that affects mental health, spiritual health, relationship within、um, bodies, learning skills, etc. And the second job I have right now is with Queens and also Ottawa U because a prof I'm working with has a hold on both places, but it's with the MFM lab. I kind of forget what it stands for, <laughs>、uh, but it's with Dr.、Uh, Linda McLean, and she is one of the world's only pelvic floor physiotherapy researchers. And right now, we're looking at the the pelvic floor physio health policies and accessibility policies, as well as some other stuff within the G20 countries, because we want to compare how Ontario is doing with our coverage within pelvic floor physiotherapy compared to the G20. Because we're not doing too great right now. Not many of our women are being covered at all by public health. I mean, public insurance. Um, and yeah, so this project is about、um, gathering the data we need to advocate for our women in need.、Mm, I see.、Um, what are some of the challenges、um, and aspects of of this research assistant position? So、um, every research job is very, very different, and it really depends on the job. But for me, in general, I find that research can. Be dry when you dig into it. Like I find that you know the topics of all my research positions are really really exciting. I really really love them, and that's why I went into them. But when you're sitting in front of your computer doing very similar tasks all the time, it gets a little dry. It gets you know you're like your back might hurt. You want to go outside,、um, but you need to keep persisting.、Um, and yeah, sometimes I'll like just be doing the same. Google search over and over again in different languages and putting into spreadsheets and that gives me a headache. But I know it's for something important and that's what keeps me going.、Mm, okay, so speaking of which, can you just go over like your day to day activities?、Um, like how does how does a day in life work as a research assistant position? So again, every research assistant、um, job is very different. It really depends on your team, depends on your supervisor, depends on、um, your experiences going into it. So, for my position at Briere, I created the research protocol、um, and I designed the research project with the help of my supervisors. And、um, so, I basically wrote a bunch of stuff describing what we were gonna do, and then I called the people that I needed to call,、uh, did recordings with them. Turn those recordings into words because we're doing a qualitative study, which means that、um, we're focusing on like interviews and we're not really focusing on numbers. And then I 
basically <laughs> label themes that I see within the um, interview that I have turned into words and um, that I'm gonna analyze it, talk about what it means, write it into a report, and submit it to a journal. Tell us about some of the things you found out during your research. Um, with the Briere job, I honestly, I like didn't know that these artists in residence programs existed at all, and I, the whole experience for me is um, feeling a sense of refreshment and seeing that like, yes, you can do things outside of the box, which I think is so important. Sometimes that's a lot you know more valuable than learning simple facts um because it it almost lets you give yourself the permission to do things that don't exist yet or um in a sense because the hospital setting especially is so formal and rigorous um and oftentimes cold i feel like a lot of people don't think that you're allowed to do something fun like this and i think that's um, it's important to see that you, you can do something very human within the hospital that's not just medication and surgery and all these scary things. Um, and with the G20 countries, one of the things I learned that is that basically every country, or from what I have learned, from what I have seen, basically every country in the G20 has some form of universal healthcare, except for the US. No. Fun fact. <laughs> oh my <laughs> Every God. single one. What? Yeah, yeah, even like, even the more, you know, unwealthy ones, and the US actually spends way more money per capita, like way more money per capita um, on each citizen on healthcare than all the countries with universal <laughs> healthcare, which is interesting, yeah. <laughs> And I've also found that it's really interesting seeing how pelvic floor physiotherapy um, shifts and changes within each country because depending on the culture of each country, um, pelvic floor physio can be very prevalent or not. There can be a lot of information on it or not since, you know, it's about the vagina and or your and or your groin and that whole area. And a lot of people feel uncomfortable talking about it. So it's very cultural. Mm -hmm. I can definitely see that. Um, I was just wondering, um, for your two jobs that you're doing right now, um, how did you actually get them in the first place? So um, I started jobs hunting um, the December before summer started. How many months is that in advance? Like almost six months, five, six months in advance. Um, so basically my... I, I, and I th I'm talking about timing because I think timing is really important. Um, because I live away from home, I knew that there were two opportunities for me to come back to have extended periods of time to do interviews if I did get any interviews. So uh, my plan was I send out a bunch of emails in December and I cold emailed a bunch of people starting with, um, I basically just looked at uh, OHRI, which is the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, and looked at all their researchers and cold emailed a bunch of the ones that um, I thought were, whose projects I thought were interesting, uh, to see if I could get any interviews for when I came back for the um, winter break. And like, that might be a little too early for a lot of people, and I didn't get anything um, in December, and so I tried again before reading break in February, and I, you know, re-emailed all those same people, but also emailed a bunch of profs at Ottawa U, um, and um, some other jobs that weren't research related as well, and I got seven emails back, uh, so I had seven meetings. Oh, damn. Yeah, I had seven meetings during the reading break, which was very interesting, because some days I would have three meetings in a day, and it was... It was, a, it was a time. <laughs> yeah. Damn. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 we have the experience as well. Oh, yeah. Especially when you have to do all those interviews for co-ops and it's yeah. like yeah. Go back to back to back. Yeah, for sure. What did you write in your uh, emails to them? How did you present um, yourself? For me, especially after my experiences in high school and university, I... I try to word myself as genuinely and as almost vulnerably as possible. And I basically wrote, it was like a classic layout for an email asking, uh, you know, a classic cold email, but with like, with genuinity. So 
I talked about who I was, why I was interested in them, um, and where I wanted to go with that. You know, I said like, hi, I'm a kinesiology student, blah, blah, blah. I'm really interested in your work. Uh, I would love to work with you either as a volunteer or part-time because I was only looking for volunteer or part-time positions then. And then uh, I wrote about why I was interested and where I thought they could take me because oftentimes, especially as students, I don't really know, but I think that, you know, half the reason why people hire students is because they want to support us, not because we're a huge asset, because we really don't know anything yet. So what they're looking for... <laughs> yeah, we're there to learn. Yeah, what they're looking for is potential and a drive and um, seeing if you have if seeing if you like know what you want and it doesn't necessarily like knowing what you want doesn't necessarily have to mean like oh i want to do this i want to do this but like being being honest with what you want and knowing like um like not being not sure and stating that is also like knowing what you want you know like you're if you're trying to find your direction that is also knowing what you want um but yeah so yeah that, that was my email <laughs> that's a good way to put it yeah, I, I like that, that you mentioned um, if you're trying to figure out what you want, it's a, it's also, you know, the same as knowing what you want because you're trying to figure it out. I never thought of it like that before. And speaking of drive and potential, in one of your interviews for the those two positions, you mentioned that you messed up. How did you fix that? Right. So um, within the interview... Um, well, actually, I didn't realize it was going to be a job interview. I came in for a volunteer interview. And then at one point, Lisa, my current supervisor, was like, Oh yeah, Carol's coming. She like, she like has this opportunity. And I was like, Oh, really? <laughs> oh, okay. And um, she did mention it to me before, but I didn't get a follow-up email about it. So I thought I didn't get the, I wasn't like being considered for this job. But yeah, Carol came to meet me. Um, and she started asking me these questions that I kind of fumble with them. And one of the questions she asked was, um, how are you with like data management and surveying? And I said, um, well, I took a data management course in high school, but I didn't really like it. So I dropped it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Yo, no. What did filter. they say? Lucy with no filter. Yeah. Oh, I had man. no filter. I was just too honest. I was too honest. Um, but, and like, I did try to save myself, but it didn't really work because I told her that I dropped the car. <laughs> what did they say to you? Uh, and they, she came, I think she just looked at me. She was kind of like, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> after I got home, I sat down and I was like, man, well, that was a oopsies. And I was, you know, like at that point, I feel like a couple years ago, I would have met texted all my friends and been like oh my god like i did this did i like email them about it should i not should i just wait blah blah, blah. but i've realized since um since then you should just do what you think you should do um so i wrote a essay another essay <laughs> i wrote not a super long <laughs> essay but i wrote like a full page which is way too long for an email especially oh, to a, like a really high up doctor That's who so has hilarious. no time to read your essay but i wrote an essay about like why i was qualified for this job um and i like while i was writing this essay i did realize like wait i have data management skills like i did all of this stuff i just completely forgot about it because i didn't realize i had a job interview and i also i was honest about that too and i was like I honestly didn't realize I was being considered for this job. Like, I wrote that all down. I think people really appreciate it when people are genuine. <laughs> so, yeah, like, I doubt she read all of it. She probably opened it and was like, oh, geez, well, let's just take her then because we don't really have anyone else right now anyways. <laughs> Clearly, she wants this job, you know? <laughs> no, yeah, she, I, I... I don't think... She did it. I don't think she actually responded to like that big email, like that big essay. She just at one point she was like, "Okay, we'll take you on." So. <laughs> no, I yeah. think honestly, just to give some context to the audience, uh, usually we ask the guests for a bio, and Lucy wrote us this beautiful essay about <laughs> her life journey. And so I think that you wrote a beautiful essay to that woman, and she read everything and instantly loved you. 
Seriously. Maybe. <laughs> I've only ever talked to her two times so far. So. Goodness. <laughs> positive conversation. It's a hit or miss. Pardon? Was uh, it oh, yeah. <laughs> hit or miss. <laughs> Was it a positive conversation those two times? Oh, yeah. Well, like, they were both, like, group meetings. Um... But yeah, she seems like a cool lady. We didn't really talk one on one much, but I have a meeting with her tomorrow for the first time in this whole stuff. She's busy. She's a busy woman. Um, and it's COVID. Yeah, and she's true. a doctor. Yeah, she's a doctor. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> she's a, in complex she... care where people have a lot of immune system issues. So I get it. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I hope that meeting goes well. Keep us updated. Yeah. yeah I'd I love to know. <laughs> One of your current passions and hobbies is your permaculture veggie garden that you're growing. First of all, what is a permaculture garden? Yeah, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> permaculture is um, it's it's uh, a set of principles um, that you can use where um, you are working with nature instead of working against it. So, if you look at our traditional commercial farms you will see that for example corn there's only corn and acres and acres and acres of land and there are all planted in rows you will never find that in nature you will never ever ever find one species of one crop planted in rows like that it just doesn't happen because that's working against nature and also part of the reason why we need so much pesticides and herbicides and all this stuff within our farms to keep them going and you know why we're destroying our soil and all that stuff um, so the pro with like the how we do things right now is that it's it's faster, it's it can be cheaper. Um, but when you work with cult when you work with nature, you take away a lot of the unhealthy side of things. You take you add in a lot of sustainability because nature is supposed to be sustainable. Growing food is supposed to be very sustainable because it's it's not it's supposed to be very natural. So when you use permaculture principles, you're not only just looking at the vegetables you're looking at, uh, I mean, you're not only looking at the vegetables you're growing, you're not just trying to plant your tomatoes and that's it. You're looking at the organisms in the soil, you're looking at the organisms around it that interacts with it. For example, like, you want to bring in the birds, you want to bring in the bees, you want to bring in the earthworms, you want to um, have different vegetables, to have different crops growing together so that they complement each other and make each other grow better. And you want to look at even, like, how the, how the weather is participating within your land so um a thing people do within permaculture is that when there's a heavy rainstorm you go outside with an umbrella and you stare at the water and the ground and see how everything is flowing Whoa. so you know like how the natural drainage system is working so you don't need to keep watering your crops like they do on commercial farms the water just works with you instead of against you um and yeah so it's it's basically trying to bring it's trying to bring the forest system back into our food and instead of trying to um, select pieces of nature that we want to have and grow it unsustainably. Right. Whoa. This is so wholesome. It's, you're basically looking at the whole ecosystem. Exactly. Exactly. Because everything matters. <laughs> Damn. Speaking yeah. of which, um, what are you actually growing and when did you actually start? Um, so I'm growing like your basic fruits and veggies right now i'm growing cucumbers tomatoes peppers um potatoes and beans and some blueberries and the cool thing about this is from like a traditional standpoint i guess from a typical gardener's perspective my garden looks like an absolute mess everything's quote unquote overcrowding each other um i don't have any fertilizer um is it looks like a mess but it's actually growing really really well i haven't had to self-pollinate i think you have to self-pollinate cucumbers because i think that's what my neighbor said but i haven't had to self-pollinate at all because i have bees and pollinators coming into my garden just naturally um because i haven't like you know sprayed anything or any of anything like that and um yeah i started um i started a little late to be honest because i didn't know how to garden before this at all um i started um like late may um so yeah that's when i started too this yeah. season <laughs> yeah yeah what are you growing rafid oh what am i growing okay so yeah. um i'm growing some red peppers some big thick cucumbers Ooh. okay <laughs> why are you saying it like that thick <laughs> thick because it is thick i can show you a picture afterwards 
Oh, cool! You guys, so you already got results from um, yeah. From, what about you, Lucy? Did you did were you able to pick any veggies? From your yeah,、brain? I have some thick cucumbers <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. I have a ton of tomatoes. I mean, like these are pretty basic, easy to grow crops too. Um, as as you know, as our crops should be, you shouldn't be growing things that aren't supposed to be growing. Avocados. In places anyway. No, avocados. <laughs> avocados. You should not be growing avocados in Canada. <laughs> honestly, honestly though, like the most frustrating part. Okay, so my green pepper is growing pretty well. I'm also my、uh, my chili plants, my banana pepper plants. Like they've grown a lot, but my、uh, red pepper ones, like my red,、uh, I think they're called bell peppers. Yeah, red bell pepper ones. They haven't grown a, a, a single inch. Like. Like they just grow leaves and flowers, but no actual red peppers, and I've been so mad because that was the one thing I was looking forward to. Okay, random question: Do you guys talk to your plants? You know that thing people say. I do.、Talk? I kiss them sometimes. Oh, really? <laughs> so cool. Do you do that, Rafid? I'm not a tree hugger. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, maybe you should try doing that to your red peppers, and they would grow. <laughs> they're gonna break. Yeah, maybe. Break. Gonna... You know, they have feelings too. You know? <laughs> no, they're gonna break if I do that. You do know that. What? You just gotta talk to them gently, not drill surgeon them. Oh, I, I oh, I, I, I said I'm not a tree hugger, so I thought you meant like I should go hug、oh. my. Oh. <laughs> no, my no, just talk to them. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna look insane. I'm gonna look insane, man. Well, your neighbors are inside and not outside. <laughs> oh, oh, I can、man. just picture that. That's please. <laughs> Dorina, shut up. Okay. okay, going back to Lucy. You talk to your fish. <laughs> I, you know, fun fact: I have a phobia of fish. I absolutely hate it. Like whenever it's time to eat fish at home, it's like super impossible. But the ir- the ironic thing is that I love eating、uh, salmon sashimi. Do not ask me how, but it just doesn't make sense. And I'm from an island, but like nobody needs to. Nobody needs to like figure out the logic behind that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Why did you decide to grow your garden? Um. So I've. I've always really wanted to know how to garden and grow food because my parents weren't really into that when I was little. Whenever I wanted to grow something, they'll be like, "Oh, that's too hard. Like, why would you want to do that? Dirt is dirty. Ew, <laughs> <no> . <laughs> dirt is dirty. <laughs> dirt is dirty. I, they're not wrong. And I think they, <laughs> yeah. And I think they came from the perspective that, like, you know, our grandparents were farmers and like farming <laughs> meant like pain.、Oh. <laughs> And not enjoy yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> like farming is going back to like poverty, and not like you know. I feel like right, gardening、yeah. now is like a lot of gardening. Like pe- wealthy people do gardening because they、it's、have、uh, time and money to put into it. It's like meditation. And land. Gardening became like yeah, exactly.、Yeah. But back then, gardening、yeah. was you know like farming, not yeah, fun. Yeah, for sure. It was more. Yeah, it was not okay, fun. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, because <laughs> my parents garden to flex on other people. <laughs> see, see, like gar- farming back in the day would not be a flex at all, and I think that was like their perspective on it. <laughs>、um, but yeah, but I've always really wanted to like be connected with the earth and be in tune with nature,、um, and I've always been the type of person to really want to dig deep and rudimentary into how everything、um, worked and like where everything came from because I really wanted to make. Sense of everything from from the very beginning to to like where we are now to avoid missing big pictures because I think it's I don't know just like learning how to code for example you need to learn the alphabet first yeah for sure yeah <laughs>、um, yeah so that was really important to me and I really wanted to have like a hands on experience with、Gardening. life yeah yeah <laughs> knowing how things work right. Yeah, how does how does someone who wants to start their own permaculture garden go about doing it? Okay, so、um, permaculture is really really complicated. If you really wanted to do like full permaculture, that means building a forest,、uh, which like not everyone can do.、Um, but、uh, what I've seen is people just recommend using as many print or、uh, like just starting small and just taking you you can take whatever permaculture principles you see. Um, as you see fit, depending on your like land and like time and what you have,、um, 
So just Google it and don't use all the advice. Don't feel overwhelmed. Just start really small because I know when I first started, I felt like I had to, you know, put trees in the ground right away. And if I didn't put trees in the ground this year, it's never going to happen. <laughs> But start small. You don't need to go big right away. Yeah. Just do what you want. It's yeah, a fun it, time. That makes sense. I mean, it can be applied to anything, right? Just start small and then make it grow bigger. Don't think about having everything in place all at once. You know? Yeah. Yeah, at one point, I was really convinced that oh I goodness. needed chickens. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I need the chickens to come no. eat the caterpillars and fertilize Yo. You're gonna get chickens? food. But obviously, I can't have chickens. <laughs> L- Lucy, Lucy, I'm just saying, you gotta, you gotta watch out, because if you bring a chicken in, you know, <laughs> I, I do really like chickens. Yeah, do not eat my chicken. chicken. It will be my best friend. <laughs> watch out. <laughs> Dude, this part, this part might get really controversial because there might be some people that are really angry about this conversation. <laughs> no, we're just, we're just kidding. Guys, guys, whoever is listening right now, we're just kidding. I'm not actually going to eat Lucy's chicken. But it is tempting. Okay, you guys are saying that. You guys are saying that, but I have a family friend whose neighbor, <clears throat> they're the same age, right? And his parents got him a chicken as a pet. But then they ended up eating the chicken. <laughs> I'm serious. Yikes. It's crazy. That's not cool. One of your other reasons for gardening, as you mentioned when we talked the first time, and in your bio as well, is that it reduces your chronic pain for a day or to two weeks at a time. Before we, you know, delve into that chapter of your life, can you explain to the audience what chronic pain is and what your symptoms are? Okay, so chronic pain as a whole just means pain that lasts more than, um, it would last between or more than three to six months. Uh, so it's a really general term and there's like a bunch of things that can fall under that. I could, you know, chronic pain can be a leg that you break and it hurts for three months or like over and over again, you know? Um, but for me, no one really exactly knows what's happening, but pretty sure, um, so far based on what my doctors and therapists um, and all these people have gathered. They think it's it's, uh, neurological pain from a concussion that I had uh, in the summer of grade 10. So I was um, almost 16 at that point. I was like two weeks away from being 16 where I got a concussion. And um, because I I didn't let myself rest and I just um, was in pain for too long my nerves couldn't understand how to calm down anymore and they just um it became a habit for them to always be turned on to pain instead of relaxation um so now i've had chronic pain on my right side for four years Uh, it kind of started in a more localized isolated isolated area but now it's been like spreading to my entire right side um you you your pains first started during the time of your concussion in August 2016 and you finished grade 10 around that time. How did you get your concussion and how did it lead to that chronic pain? Um, so how I got, how I got the concussion was that I was being a little dumb. Um, and I I was in front of this mirror and I was trying to switch out my earring. Um, so I took out the earring and I tried putting another one back in, but it wouldn't go in. Uh, for whatever reason, I was fidgeting around and I was in front of the mirror getting a little cross-eyed for like seven minutes and I decided, okay, whatever, I'll just stab it in. I'll suck it up, I'll stab it in. So I did. I stabbed it in. Ouch. And I was like, okay, that's fine. But then I realized, oops, that's the wrong earring. That's not the one I want in my ear. So I took it out and I couldn't put it the one I wanted in again um so i stabbed that one in too and then i guess i was you know nauseous faint um and so i fainted and i hit my head on the wall and that's how i got my concussion uh and the reason why it lasted for so long was because i did not i did i didn't want to rest i didn't want to accept the fact that i was in pain i didn't want to accept the fact that i needed to um calm down (laughs) <laughs> so I just yeah. went on with my life after a couple days of healing when I felt a little bit better. You know, I was working out. I was going to, like, math tutoring. 
<laughs> Didn't you have rugby too? Oh no, rugby ended. Rugby too? Rugby ended. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I played rugby for a little bit, but I did not get concussed. I should have, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah, for context, I'm 4'10 and a half. So <laughs> that's why they kept, that's why people kept talking about it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I played a forward, a blindside flank, in case you're interested. <laughs> 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 All right, so part of the reason for not, for you not stopping your activities to heal uh, and rest during that time was the mindset of pain is basically weakness, in your opinion. So did you grow... In my previous yes, opinion. not your current one, but your previous one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you grow up in a culture where you were always expected to show strength? Like, you're always the, uh, the, the she yeah. guy or whatever? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that especially in the immigrant culture and in in the Asian culture, also the immigrant culture, and also um, the American culture to varying degrees, I think pain is really, pain and struggle is really romanticized because you always hear about, you know, the years and years that this person slaves their way into becoming a billionaire or like this person that you know, slaves themselves to come to Canada or like rebuilds a village with their bare hands, you know, all, all this stuff. Um, and I he heard a lot of those stories growing up, whether it was um, stories about family friends or like people they knew or historical figures um, within the culture or, you know, like Bill Gates sleeping Legends. in a gym. Legends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, you know, I took those pretty to heart, especially because of the way they were um, told to us. And uh, I was taught that whenever I felt pain, I needed to embrace it, um, which is which is good in a way, but it gets toxic when you do it in inappropriate times. But I was told that, you know, um, working hard is supp supposed to be painful. It's supposed to be suffering, but there are, you will always be rewarded at the end. Um, and so an example of where this is toxic would be when you have a concussion because you cannot heal unless you calm down and <laughs> stop doing everything. There is no other way to heal. You literally cannot push through the pain. You are not supposed to push through the pain, but because of all of this stuff that I was, you know, taught and because I wasn't, I didn't know how to like handle pain any other way i just tried pushing through that and obviously it doesn't work so it just got worse and worse and worse and now i have chronic pain <laughs> what sort of expectations were placed on you as you were growing up um so i i was expected to you know get good grades do good things um make my parents proud um make their efforts um worthwhile all that stuff and I think a lot of it honestly comes down like your parents will say like this is for you this is for you um you need to do this so you can have a stable life in the future but I think a lot of it is also like you need to look good for others you need to look like you're having a great time a great life you need to look like you're doing um great things uh so others can be proud of you and feel uh you know not need to feel bad for you right and not humiliate the family yes that kind of mindset yeah. uh what sort of extracurriculars did you do well starting off in grade nine it, i did you know band musicals um i and i did a lot of outside of school stuff so guitar dance um chinese school and i think a couple of other things uh but the so when you look at all of that, um, it looks like fun and games. They look like really fun things. But underneath it all, like, yes, I was interested in all of that, but because I was doing so much and I, because I was doing it with the mindset that, like, I need to be good at all of this stuff, like, I need to be the best at everything, it became a chore. It wasn't, it became something that I had to do instead of wanted to do. And so I ended up not liking, I ended up dropping out of all three bands. I ended up not doing music after that. Like, it just, it defeated the purpose. Um, and then, in grade 10, I um, 
in grade 10 was halfway through grade 10 I dropped out of my bands uh, and I did a lot of other things so, and I forget but I did a lot of stuff and then in grade 11 I did a lot more student council I did um technovation and in grade 12 I did more student council and more technovation some case competitions here and there in my upper years too yeah I I actually relate to that because of the fact that um like I, I know that I was going through that phase in first and second year where I felt like I need to put all this stuff on my resume because um, like it, the more I get involved the more space I fill on my resume but then after a point I realized like you want to know what what's the point of me doing this if it's just my resume because if, if I'm not if I'm not putting my heart into it and if I'm not truly enjoying it then like I won't be able to write on my resume of my passions I'll just be writing on stuff that I did. I found that when you write, like the stuff you write in your resume that you're actually passionate about are the stuff that stands out within the resume. So I... Yeah. Yeah, and I find that like, especially during and after grade 11, um, you know, titles are really meaningless. Titles don't tell you anything. Organize, like the titles of either your position or your organization, they don't mean anything at all unless you tell us what you learned and how you felt so if you're not passionate if you're not actually interested yeah i just will have like, never done it okay um i just want to add one more thing onto this so this is to like all the people who are going for lead roles for like clubs or events there's a lot of people who go for lead roles because it just looks good on a resume but honestly when you get into the interview if you don't have anything to back that up if you're like the lead that didn't actually like do too much you just basically just told people what to do or like you you let the other lead do most of the stuff you're not gonna have much of a story to tell like the interview like when you get into the interview it's all about how it's all about the story right so i really re reiterate to other people like if you're going to do a lead position i i always advocate that you try to do your best to cultivate team culture team diversity these types of things into into the team it, it'll not only like make your resume stronger but you'll enjoy it a lot more and you'll actually learn a lot from doing that yeah absolutely good advice lucy like you mentioned in your essay to us those extracurriculars well you did enjoy them uh they were more for growing your resume and you know proving yourself and it all came to a head and shifted your perspective on life when you became head of spirit for the student council in grade 11. And to put a timeline to this, that was a couple of months after you got your concussion in August 2016. Ah, uh, yes. First off, yeah. <laughs> First off, what does Head of Spirit do at your high school, which is Earl of March? Um, so, the Head of Spirit did a lot of stuff. There were bi-weekly events. There were um, bi semesterly events that were really big. Um, and there were extra stuff you could add on, um, and spirit weeks, so, like, bi-monthly, there was a lot of stuff, but the biggest thing was, um, Battle of the Grades, or BOG, it's an annual fundraiser that we do every single year, and all of this, um, like, most people on student council would agree that the role of Head of Spirit is the most work-intensive, like, it's more... People would say that it is more work intensive than, you know, president or vice president. And I was president, so I can attest to the fact that Head of Spirit was more work. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the BOG, Battle of the Grades, took me like eight months to plan. And the other roles took like two months to a few weeks to a few days. So yeah big job <laughs> yeah i remember this um like bog at the time was just so ridiculously large and every like everyone was participating that year like even the great nines were doing a much better job uh that year and um i and then and then going on more about like about the grades in general is that it was one of the biggest charities probably in canada at the time and yeah uh, maybe yeah i think i think it definitely was because we had, because we, you'll you'll say the number of potatoes that <laughs> that that we got. Yeah, but potatoes. Um, but you but you said that Battle of the Grades, like the fundraiser itself, was virtue signal signaling. Um, can you explain a, a little bit of what 
virtual signaling means? Um, so virtual signaling is kind of when you do something in order to show other people that uh, you have good morals or uh, you are a good person. And I don't, I think that virtual signaling usually starts with a good intention. Um, but it's just, you know, it's, it's hard for everyone to always be aware of what's going on beneath all these issues and causes, especially when there are so many around and, you know, people just, people want to be a good person. I mean, people want to be good people. Um, but you know, everyone, I think everyone virtual virtue signals. Um, and it's also just hard to like completely understand your personal subconscious motivations, um, when you do participate in you know, charities and, like, causes, um, but I, uh, Battle of Grades was when, it was, like, one of the moments in my life when I really understood what virtual signaling was, because my, when I was growing up in my family, we didn't, we didn't donate much, we didn't, you know, do a lot of charity stuff, um, it, it wasn't, it just wasn't something we did, because my parents came from a background where it, they thought that, you know, like, you're responsible for your life, um, you don't know where the money is going if you donate, and, um, like, I don't agree with this, but this is, like, what I was taught, and they also, um, thought that, like, it's good to take care of the people around you, but beyond that, it's none of your business, um, so Battle of Grades is, like, the time where I was the most involved with, um, charities, um, ever and so uh, during this event um we have categories of um items that you can bring in and every uh grade gets a certain number of points per item you bring in and you know depending on the category and the amount you bring in all of that stuff uh and there were also points for like spirit and um you know sportsmanship and all of that stuff uh and the main category that I chose that year was fresh food because this lady came in to talk about how we have a shortage of fresh healthy food within the community and how healthy food um, was a really big issue for our community right now because there is enough food but just not enough healthy food and healthy food is what we really need to make sure that people in need are getting what they need um and because of that um presentation i i thought like wow like this is so important i need to do something about it so i created the category for fresh food but i didn't realize the category was going to be flawed in the sense that when it came down to it potatoes were going to be the cheapest way to gain as many points as possible yeah <laughs> yeah because i didn't take into account of the fact that people were going to price match for bulk potatoes and sell out Kanata, and I didn't realize people were gonna bring in, um, say it with me, 11,430 pounds of 95 or 99% potatoes. <laughs> that is crazy. That is a yeah. huge amount of potatoes. A huge was, amount of potatoes. That was the battle of the potatoes. That was battle the battle of the great, that was the battle of the potatoes. Exactly. Didn't you guys say some uh, some grocery stores banned the students from <laughs> buying potatoes? Yeah, yeah. Grocery stores banned Earl March children. I mean, kids, teenagers, <laughs> from buying potatoes. People like drove out to Stittsville to buy potatoes. It was nuts. Um, oh, and yeah, people called it the Kanata potato famine. <laughs> it was. <laughs> I remember. It was okay, huge. Was the funniest thing. Okay, food basics, right? My my parents were gonna were gonna get potatoes that weekend, and they said they were they was they were sold out. And I'm like, I can bring you potatoes if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I know where they're. I can be your what source. What did they say? Oh, the yeah. people must my have parents? been so confused as to why there were no more potatoes. Like, who runs yeah. out of potatoes? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. my god. And like. So like my par- So I told my parents like, oh yeah, uh, my school basically hoarded eleven thousand pounds of potatoes. And my parents were like, wait, what? <laughs> like, my, like, they started What is going they're on like, at school? They're like, they're, they're, they're like, are you guys all making fries or something? I'm like, no, 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 it's for charity. <laughs> <laughs> we're all making fries. The 1,000 students are eating 11,000 oh pounds goodness. of fries. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my God, hilarious. it's crazy. Oh, that's too many fries. Oh, uh, 
yeah, health concerns, right? Right, there. right. What, what, where did I put my my kid? What school did I put them in? <laughs> yeah. And before I go on, I just want to say that, like, I, like, I think the spirit that our, our school had was like very impressive. The fact that we could bring in that many potatoes at all was, you know, very impressive. But I think the motive behind those potatoes were, you know, like a little. We didn't realize our subconscious and or maybe conscious motives, which was to win and not to do the best thing for um, people in need. Because, you know, if we really, really wanted to do the best thing, we wouldn't have bought only potatoes and we would have done um, things such as give more monetary donations because like it's 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 a hard fact that most charities what they really need is just money because they know what to do with the money they know um, how to spend it well and where it needs to be um, but when we overload for example like when when cereal companies have a faulty product they just send it to the food they send it to the food banks because it looks good on them but it's unhealthy. It was stuff that couldn't sell, you know, um, virtual signaling. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so like not exactly like that, but kind of like that. We we did we did what was best for us to win, and every single grade did that. Like everyone was in it, um, so it wasn't like one person's fault, and like no one had. No one wanted to be a bad person, you know? But it happened because I don't think we... I think our motivation for Battle of the Grades was to win way before Battle of the Grades even happened. Um, way... Yeah, like, from from the... During the Battle of the Grades previously, our motive was just to win again or win the next year, to beat the other grades. Um, and the, it was really clear that it wasn't about the charities when it was just about winning because there was just so much there was so much drama and so much uh, dis divisiveness so a lot of divide and a lot of toxic competition between all the grades um during that year and previous years and you know um it wasn't about working together to do the best for the charities and uh, you know a lot of divisiveness was my fault um, because I I honestly cheated in the beginning because I also came from the idea that it was all about just beating the other grades. So I cheated, I created a divide. Well, I added a layer of divide that wouldn't have been there in the first place. Um, and that was also my bad because I was virtual signal virtue signaling. I like that entire role for me was virtue signaling in a way. I did care about the charities. I did care about, you know, having a healthier community and that's why I added in fresh food. But, you know, I was virtue signaling. <laughs> Plain and simple. <laughs> I honestly, Lucy, like, I remember you getting a lot of heat um, during that time. And I was actually one of the people to actually say, like, yo, 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 let's let's not go too hard on her. Like, she's she's doing the best she can and she and she definitely did not expect eleven thousand pounds of potatoes coming out her door. <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, like you honestly did handle it really well. Like Thank for, you. For, for a sixteen year old, like I could definitely not have handled that. That's a lot that. of pressure. Greena, could you? I mean, at 16, no. What was I doing at 16? I think I was just, like, eating junk food, you know, and going to school. <laughs> like, no, nah, like, that is, that's a lot of pressure. And, you know, being able to deal with yeah. that yeah. much pressure and getting through it, especially while you were going through, you know, dealing with chronic pain as well. Like, kudos to you for, for yeah. making it out. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people knew about my chronic pain yeah. back then, because I didn't know either. I was just like, ah, that hurts, whatever, let's go. <laughs> Here, to put it into perspective for the audience, like, the scale bow of the grades is like edge frosh, uh, or like frosh in general, but for high school. And with really, really, really immature high school students everywhere. So yeah. you can imagine how intense that is to like, you know, keep it at bay so i think yeah. lucy did her best too like <laughs> and with a time. very very like i was like i'm not proud of the fact that i was the only organizer like i had help here and there but be because of like because of all, of all the divisive issues and because of all the competition and because of my uh want to virtue signal um i just did the organization basically by myself so that was a lot of work 
<laughs> yeah, one man frosh. One man, one man frosh is what it was. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, having done all those extracurriculars, what do you recommend that students do to get those opportunities? Um, so in high school, I recommend you to take whatever opportunities that you are interested in that come to you. Um, because oftentimes, you know, high school f- spoons feed the spoon feeds them to us. They're always, you know, always on the announcements, always on posters. Teachers are always talking about them. It's always on social media. <laughs> the Nike slogan it. right there. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Nike slogan. And if you want to go a step ahead, you should look for them. You should, you know, scroll through the social media, listen to the announcements, look at the information boards. And if you want to go another step deeper, you should Google about them. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's it's different, you know, when your life outside of high school is not the same. Like in high school, like Lucy said, like you're saying, all the opportunities are right in front of you. Just pick one. But when you're out, when you're out of high school, you have to go and find those opportunities for yourself. You have to be able to create those opportunities for yourself. So this is the time where you have the chance to just learn without having to figure out how to get them. Yeah, yeah. And you will learn how to figure out how to get them while you're doing these opportunities at the same time. So it's a win, win, win. Exactly. (laughs) All right. So now that we've talked a little bit about this, it's time for us to play our signature rapid fire round. Um, You have five seconds to answer a few questions and then Rafid is going to time you. Makes sense? Okay. Sounds good? Sure. Sounds good. You ready? Yep. All right. What's your biggest accomplishment so far? My biggest accomplishment? <laughs> okay, and never mind. Time's up. <laughs> what is it? Um. Just tell us. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is taking more than five no, seconds. No, just okay. what, seriously, what's the biggest one? I think my biggest accomplishment so far is um, the initiative I'm doing with my friend right now because so I created this initiative with my friend uh, without trying to make it humongous. I I went into it without making a big deal. I went into it without being competitive and I went into it saying, yo, Jesse, if we get stressed, let's just close down the account and put a little sign up saying, VRB, we're stressed, give us two weeks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no i like how you put it because you know it's just generally something you're passionate about and you're just you're doing it for you for fun you know to help others it has nothing to do with putting it on your looking good or, or looking yeah. good yeah exactly kind of like this podcast i really want to reiterate that me and rafid we just generally want to try to help as many people as many students as we can yeah that's about it like honestly um yeah if, if i if i didn't then i wouldn't have bothered like doing exactly. this. Exactly. I would have I would have been like, uh, ah, let's just let's just leave it to some other guy. But I know I felt Exactly. I felt I felt like this could be fun and we could actually have a good time doing it. So Yeah. Yeah. Alright, next question. Are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. I'm just not gonna look at your countdown <laughs> this time. <laughs> What's the weirdest thing you've ever done? Oh <laughs> um Gosh, Lucy. You're so bad at this. You're so bad at No, this. there's just so many things. No, you gotta pick one fast. What's the weirdest thing? Well, I don't think this should be on the podcast. <laughs> what? <laughs> Is it not appropriate? I mean, if you want to hear weirdest, like, I don't think it's gonna be appropriate. <laughs> what is it? Well, there are many things. Okay, pick one. <laughs> Um, this can't be on the podcast. <laughs> Do you want to hear? Do you want to know? Okay, fine, fine. We'll, yeah. we'll put it on the podcast then. Okay, yeah. so I'll, I'll, I'll cut it out right now. So you'll we'll get the next question, guys. All right, are we ready to move on to the next question? Yeah, we're ready to move on. Are you ready, Lucy, to win? <laughs> What's the scariest thing that's happened to you? <laughs> Time's up. Uh, Time's up. Darn. Time's up. There's a lot of, there's just a lot of things, man. There's just okay, no one, one isolated thing. What is it? Um, when I got accepted into Queen's Commerce, that was pretty frightening. <laughs> um, 
more cold water got poured like like um uh, not cold actual cold water but like mental cold water got poured down my back and i was like oh my god this is terrible like my mom really 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 wanted me to go into queen's commerce because she you know it's I about the that. prestige and it's about the stability but i really didn't want to and like you know at the back of my head like it, it's not like a cocky thing but i just knew that like my qualifications would let me in so at the back of my head i was kind of always bracing for the moment where i got my acceptance letter but when i actually did i like i didn't tell her about it I like kind of told my dad and I was like, dad, you cannot tell her I got accepted because she would have like forced me to go. He did end up telling her about it, but I think she was at the stage of, you know, you know, the stages of grief. She was at acceptance. <laughs> <laughs> so like she was really mad about it and she, um, you know, it was not a fun time. It's not pretty. It got, you know, it was bad. It was real bad. Um, but I wasn't yeah. forced to go in the end, but it, it was a struggle. Yeah. Nice. It was a fight. All right, next nice. question. The, I'm, this time I'm really rooting for you. You just gotta think fast on your feet, okay? No, oh, they're no, just no. too many. Okay. Listen. <laughs> no, just don't okay. think about it. Okay. Describe your teenage self in three words. A little much, um, friendly, um, yes. a little sad. Okay, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Good job, there good go. job. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So, what's the latest book you've read? Oh, oh, um, uh, this book about community, the structure of belonging. Nice. <laughs> okay. That's what's good. the best gift you've ever received? Um, a male. <laughs> male? Mail. Oh, like letters. Oh, yeah. Like you mean. Oh, like, so I've cool. never, oh, okay. I've never received mail from anyone, but like the bank and Amazon before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But my housemate, one of my housemates, really into mailing stuff. That is so cool. Um, so she sent me some mail, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Honestly, honestly, for a sec, I thought. I thought what Lucy meant by male, I thought she meant a boyfriend, and I'm like... Oh ah. my god! <laughs> no, <laughs> that works. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, it works! It works, it works, it works. It works. Snail <laughs> mail. <Yeah>. Pigeon mail. <laughs> alright, alright. That's hilarious. Um, okay, so if you had one, one, only one, not one, not two, not three, not four. Really? Only one superpower. What would it be? I, I would fly. <laughs> there we go. You got it. Mine would be reading people's minds. I would hate to I read people's minds. I would love to minds. know what everyone's thinking. I would. That would just be too much dude, information. Dude, Karina, you do you do not want to like see what a sixteen year old boy is thinking of. Okay, I'm just okay. saying. Oh god. I'm just saying. <laughs> Maybe not that one. I rephrase. I would want to be able to choose whose mind I can read. Uh. <laughs> Last question, actually. What's the one thing in your room that you can't live without? Oh, my um. My um natural sunlight sunrise okay. alarm clock. Nice. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's a natural sun clock. Yeah. So it basically simula simulates the sunrise and sunset, and it helps you like wake up and fall asleep better. <laughs> Darina, your face. Okay, just for the audience, Darina's face is like the funniest thing I've ever seen. I should have taken a screenshot. Oh, we have it recorded. Yo, honestly, make that your profile pic. Oh my god, wait. Does it like... <laughs> <laughs> so it, you know, it has like... <laughs> it's clinically <laughs> proven. <laughs> oh, it's... Okay, cool. I think I know what you're talking about. So it kind of like... It lights up, right? But it yeah. feels like sunlight? Yeah, like slowly. You can set the timer. Oh my god, that's so- Okay, that's kind of cool. Alright, thank you for playing. That was super fun. Actually. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yo, honestly, Lucy, you got 50% on that test. A 50? <laughs> Way lower! <laughs> no, she I definitely got- I got like two. two. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to some serious questions now. 
you know, after going through all those challenges in grade 11, you became student council president in grade 12, and you focused your efforts more towards community, mentorship, and developing your leadership skills. What are some of the examples of the things you did in grade 12? So, um, because in grade 11, I didn't delegate my role at all, um, due to a bunch of, bunch of reasons, um, that I have unlearned, <laughs> uh, I created, uh, I re, I reintroduced the pancake breakfast back to school and I kind of incorporated it into, uh, BOG. So it was really, really big. Um, over 600 people attended, which was a little more than half of our school population, um, which was also, I think, the, you know, one of the events that got the most participation, like, maybe in history, other than, I don't know, like, graduation, or, I don't actually, no, never mind. Um, but, you know, I had a lot of participation, and I really focused on managing groups this time. I made groups for everything, I made teams for everything, and, yeah, it was a really different way of doing things for me. Um, and I also took up a mentorship role with Technovation where I mentored four girls on uh, business and technology and that was really fun because I got to, it wasn't, it wasn't, I feel like managing a team and mentoring a team is very different because managing a team meant you give a little piece of attention to everybody and you kind of like herd them like sheep. <laughs> Um, and like try to be as personal as possible obviously but mentorship it's a lot more about personal development and I found that to be really interesting um, and I should have spent more time with them but sadly life got in the way <laughs> are you still in touch with them yeah I'm in touch with one of them and like we're definitely still on speaking terms with the other ones but yeah I message one of them like from time to time and we meet up from time to time um, and I also focused a lot on my personal relationships because um, I think to be a good leader, you, well, that's not necessarily true. I think to be a very effective leader in the long term and a leader that creates community rather than divides community, you need to be really good at handling your personal relationships. And I, like, that wasn't the goal of me working on my personal relationships, but um, I spent a lot of time with my personal relationships during grade 12 as well. I think a good example of leadership during your high school experience as well was taking that initiative to reach out uh, to physiotherapies in Ottawa to learn more about kinesiology, which is what you ended up choosing. Can you share the story with the audience? Um, so I, like, I knew I wanted to do kinesiology, but my parents were really hesitant about it and I wanted to learn more anyways. So I emailed maybe like 30, 40 clinics at different periods. Um, of time and I got three responses so I you know grabbed all three and um, went to shadow everyone the three clinics emailed back because one uh, the first clinic that emailed back was really interested in giving students opportunities the second one emailed me back because they thought it was really interesting that um, a high school student who is not doing uh, who is not doing this for volunteer hours or for co-op is you know trying to take the initiative and learn more because usually people do it because they want to get something extra out of it um, other than learning they want to put it on their resume or whatever and I ex explicitly said that I didn't it wasn't for my resume I just wanted to learn more and so that's what caught his attention and I also had the same name as his wife so shout out I'm not gonna name this person, but shout out to you. Thank you so much, I learned so much. Um, and the third um, clinic that got back to me was a, it, it was one of, it was a physio chain. It was one of the pro physio clinics and they often had students around, so they took me on. Um, and um, so during the experience, um, I learned a lot because, um, well, one, I was interested in learning because I was also going through a lot of physical symptoms with my body. So I learned a lot about um, pain and like the body and connected it back to my pain and the body and learned about a lot of other things too. And I, it was really important for me because I was learning actively instead of passively. I was thinking of questions. I was connecting dots in my head. I was, you know, like I wasn't just looking and being like, oh, that's cool. You're massaging. That's great. Like, oh, <laughs> 
arm cool whatever um and yeah and another thing that was really cool uh was how different each place that i went to was um it really showed me that your the career career or the job you go into doesn't define your um doesn't define your work it doesn't doesn't define you as a person you define your own career because you know every nurse can work and look very very different every computer coder I forgot. <laughs> uh, computer science, com every coder, software engineer, every software engineer <laughs> can be very, very different. Some software engineers can just work with a computer. Some software engineers can be very, very social. Who knows? Yeah, definitely, that is the case. It's true. Yeah. Like me and Dorina are very social software it's engineers. It's true. So like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're we're not those stereotypical ones that you always hear about. Did you always mm -hmm. know that you wanted to go into kinesiology? No, I thought I wanted to go into business for a while in high school and before that I just really wasn't sure. But in high school, because of the extracurriculars I was doing, it looked very commerce because, you know, the stereotypical commerce person is um, high achieving, social, like leadership. But when you really think about it, that could mean anything. That could that could be any role, but for some reason, within the context of uh, the high school that we were in and uh, what my parents were looking for, it looked like business because business was also very, um, from what they saw, stable. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't. It's not always stable, but you know, like the pers more prestigious programs, more stable. You make money fast, mm -hmm. um, and very competitive. And a part of um, what I why I thought I wanted to go into commerce was because it, it's a very competitive environment. Um, and I really liked to win and look good in That's a business on. mindset. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I really, not anymore, but in like grade 9, 10, and a little half of 11, I'd say, I just wanted to win, beat everyone else, and look good. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, why did you actually have that switch from commerce to kinesiology? Like, why did you end up like being like, okay, this is going to be the career for the rest of my life? Um, well, I wouldn't say it's going to be the career for the rest of my life because like life is mm -hmm. flexible and you know, your True. degree or profession doesn't really define you True. as a person. But I had that switch because I realized I realized the only reason why one of the only reasons why I wanted to go into commerce was because I wanted to win and look good. It wasn't because I wanted to, you know, create a business or um, work in a nonprofit or like, you know, do something more meaningful. It wasn't because I liked numbers. It wasn't because I loved marketing. It wasn't any of that. Um, and when I realized that, it was also when I realized how meaningless winning and looking good is. And how, it was when I realized how meaningless having all these titles were because you know, at um, end of grade 11, beginning of grade 12, like I, I had a bunch of titles for, for like a 17, 16 year old kid, had a bunch of titles. And after I got them, they were, the titles themselves are pretty worthless and it didn't mean much at all. Um, and so I kind of saw, I saw firsthand how little it meant and I realized what I actually cared about and I, um, realize why I thought those titles and things were so important to me bef before and it was just because you know I was taught that they were important they were important to me they were important to um, the people around me the question was like having go gone through all those challenges in high school and especially with about the grades and your chronic pain how has your high school experience impacted your university experience thus far Right, right. Okay. So in university, I am, I don't look for, um, I'm not, I find myself not trying to go for leadership roles anymore because I realize like I, leadership is cool, but I don't like it. I don't know. I like, I like mentorship and I like, I like leadership. I like, um, being a leader by example and being a leader by influence, not being a leader because uh, people were told that I have a title, you know, like I want people to um, want to um, be influenced by me, 
not be not like just accept the influence uh and i really i find myself um being honest to myself and because like about the fact that i don't like council positions i don't like clubs um i i just don't like the environment so i'm doing a lot more one-on-one things like um being i'm volunteering for revved up uh which is a uh program with adapted exercise programs with um people with mental and physical disabilities. So I'm working one-on-one with people. I'm influencing them on a very personal level. They don't have to listen to me if they don't want to, but they could if they think, you know, I'm worthwhile to listen to. Um, And um, I'm doing a lot more... What am I doing? (laughs) But like, you know, like the point is, I've, I find myself avoiding heavy titles. I find myself, um, you know, heavy titles aren't bad, but it's just personally not good for me. And I find myself avoiding environments that look good. Um, and I find myself going towards for environments sure. that think, feel good. You know, you're, you're choosing things that you're actually genuinely interested in and that you hope to have an, a positive impact into the world. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a big thing with that is sometimes what you're actually what you think you're actually interested in is really heavily intertwined with what you think you should be interested in and that was also something hard for me to figure out because um even after even in the beginning of first year I was like wait no I should be interested in applying for this I should be interested in applying for that but I wasn't actually, and I was confused as to why I felt hesitant about applying because I was like, but no, this is really good, so you should want to do this, but I didn't because I was struggling between the should right. and want. What advice so. would you have for someone who's in a similar position as you were in high school? Um, I, I would say that, like, it's okay if you're struggling. If you're struggling, it probably means you need to learn something. And it's, if you're struggling, like embrace the struggle and ask yourself why. Because oftentimes there are so, the root of the cause might be deeper than you think. You might, you might hit one thing and realize, oh, why you're doing this, but it might go like, it might go way deep. And something as simple as, you know, struggling um with motivation to apply to positions might might like go to something from when you're five years old and um yeah i think people i think like we run away from our struggle like we shouldn't romanticize struggling but we also run try to run away from it at the same time and a sense where you are trying to just push past your struggle instead of embracing it and Uh, as a learning opportunity because you know chances are chances are life is saying bro you need to learn this can you please can you please come back and figure this out yeah (laughs) no for sure i agree like even now with covid and self uh, isolation i'm spending so much more time with myself when i'm discovering you know new hobbies new things that i enjoy i'm thinking back to things that i struggled with and how i can be better so yeah i definitely agree um going back to queens um what's the culture i'm gonna like? change it from what i saw last time a little bit um i think the culture at queens um well people say that the culture at queens is play hard work hard um and sleep very little uh, but i think that it's actually feel pressure to play hard feel pressure to work hard And a lot of people are really rich, so it looks a lot easier than it would be if you're not. So don't don't feel bad if you can't play as hard or work as hard, because some people just have an advantage. Um, And like, like I'm not super rich, but I'm definitely like privileged. Um, So I, where was I going with that? Like, I, I feel like I fit right into the middle. You know, like, I have enough privileges for me to be able to play and work hard, but I can't play as hard as some of the other people out there going on vacation all the time and still getting straight A's. But, you know, you need to recognize the fact that, like, if you are struggling with a culture at Queens, and I'm sure it happens in other places too, if you 
feel like you're not as good as other people, you need to just recognize like, oh, there, you know, everyone has their, um, has upper hands and well different sorts of upper hands like or, or like you know you could be really rich but have mental health issues so it's hard to do both but yeah like don't judge yourself too hard if you feel all these pressures yeah i agree like everyone has their individual strengths and weaknesses so that's also that's good advice don't judge yourself too harshly because you know the outside world is already judging you enough so always you know, think positively about yourself. It will help yeah. you in the long run. And chances are the outside world isn't judging you at all. Exactly. <laughs> it's all in your head. Yeah. Growing up, your view of success was about building the resume, getting top marks, and being recognized for it. After going through what you did with your uh, chronic pain as well, how did you? How do you define success now? So now I define success as um, being very connected with um, life and the people around you and being in tune um, and being very compassionate. So, um, well, stepping away from that for a little bit, I, 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 would, I just want to mention that, like, um, you know, the American dream is to be wealthy, to have a pick, white picket fence, two kids, car and house, whatever. And a dog. But I feel dog. like, uh, and yes, a and a dog. And the dog. <laughs> you know, yeah, pretty wife, whatever. <laughs> um, but I feel like people often forget that every single idea of success is actually ch to achieve happiness because people forget like people forget the ultimate goal is happiness and people just think about the steps they think they need to take to get to happiness because society has laid it out for us like it's like the recipe to happiness but people forget that you can be happy without doing those things um so yeah so success like i think that is why success can look different for everybody and for me what makes me happy and what makes me successful is being connected in tune and compassionate um and when i say compassionate i really mean like responsible and accountable so um being very connected to the people around me is very important because like i don't, personally i can't be happy if i don't have community like that's one of the basic human needs for happiness after food and water and shelter you need to have a um you need to feel a sense of belonging with the people around you um i want to be in tune because um i don't i don't want to always live in that superficial world where like everything is about you know what we see on tv and like money and like money's great but like there's also toxic sides of money and all that stuff i want to be in tune with like what's real um so like growing my food be being in nature all that stuff and just being in tune with like my body my life instead of like systems that we have created in this world that doesn't actually exist um it's kind of like the matrix you know lots of matrixes <laughs> and my last thing is compassion so being being responsible and accountable to not only the people around me but um the larger community and people i can't see but as well as um, the things, the non-people, the plants, the animals, the rocks, the landforms, the weather, <laughs> and all that stuff. Because in order for the greatest health and success of the people around me, I also need to care about the greater community. And I think it's also, it's also just like, um, in isolation, really important to care about the greater community because they're people too. Um, just because you don't see them or talk to them doesn't mean they're important. And... Um, for me, I personally call it extended compassion because it's really easy to be compassionate to your friends and family because you see them all the time, you understand them, you um, see their struggles, you see their good and bad, um, and you it's so easy to help a friend or a family member or your neighbor if they're in need, but it's so hard to help someone in Lebanon or like in South Africa or in the middle of the ocean to help that fish in the, in the Red River or whatever. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I think extended compassion is really important because we're all connected and there is just 
so much that we don't know um, about the things we can't see. So for example, trees. Trees have roots that all connect, well, the same species of trees connect their roots all together within the forest or if they're just close by, they connect all the roots together to kind of almost form a single organism that shares resources and create microclimates. And if you chop down one tree, you affect all of them. If one tree gets cut down, the other trees will feed that tree to keep it alive if it has enough connections. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a huge community system and people don't, people don't know because we don't recognize that. And I think that if we all, you know, recognize the fact that there's so much we don't know and recognize the fact that we, we should have compassion and extend our compassion to um, things way beyond ourselves, we would be just so much more responsible for the environment, for other people. It, it would be really hard to, you know, take advantage of the poor. It would be really hard to randomly cut down trees for money. Um, you know, for we don't need toothpicks, but we cut down trees for toothpicks. Why do we need toothpicks? Like, we don't need so many toothpicks. I get why we need toothpicks. <laughs> <laughs> you flip and I don't flop know. like no tomorrow, like a fish. <laughs> we can reuse toothpicks. We can get reusable toothpicks. We you reuse our wooden chopsticks. Why can't we reuse toothpicks, you know? Um, and, you know, we'd be so much more responsible with our oceans and all those things. And we think 30 more times before we go into a land and destroy it. If we um, think like, oh, maybe there are hundreds and thousands and billions of microorganisms in the soil that I don't know about. And, you know, harm, even just digging a hole can affect that ecological system that kind of holds our earth together. Well, not... It doesn't hold our earth together, but you get what I mean. It's big part. Yeah, yeah. Did you know fungi? Did you know fungi connect, uh, communicate with the trees? Isn't that wild? Right, it's part of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I knew it's that. It's crazy. I actually knew that. I actually knew that. Oh, really? Yeah, but fungi will spread all across the forest or like, you know, like hundreds and thousands of acres. It will spread across and communicate with all the trees and like help it do stuff and like share resources and all this stuff is crazy it's wild it's amazing <laughs> you know going back to your 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 struggles with chronic pain having had this condition since you know you were in since 2016 it's been four years now and listening to you now you're i find that you're a very very positive person how have you managed to say stay, stay that positive um i think I think that actually my dad always turns bad situations. He always looks for the bright side in every situation in almost a quirky way because a lot of people would not think about those things. So I've always, um, growing up, I've always tried to do the same. Um, so yeah, I've kind of, I have a learned positive mindset, but also um, I guess it's also a coping mechanism to be positive. Um, and it's one of the, you know, like, it's one of the healthier coping mechanisms. Um, and I, so because of those things, I choose to see my chronic pain as a learning opportunity uh, and a guide in life. Because yes, it sucks, it's painful. Um, but if you think about it, it forces me to live a better life. Uh, because if I feel too much anxiety, my chronic pain will spike. If I sit too long, my chronic pain will spike. So that means I get to get up on my feet a lot more and I get to do things that, um, don't give me as much anxiety. And like, the anxiety part, like, it's different. Like, if it's, like, that, that part's a little different. It depends on, like, different types of anxiety cause different, um, amounts of pain or, like, cause no pain at all. But... In all, like, my chronic pain genuinely forces me to have a better life. And it also, it's forcing me to take a lighter course load, which I have always wanted to do because I think that um, having a lighter course load allows you to learn better and allows you to have a better life in general. Yeah. And it also, it has also, like, propelled me to go into kinesiology because I want to explore physiotherapy and all of that. If, if I didn't have my chronic pain, I would be in business and I would be sad right now and I would be having life crises so thank god I got my chronic pain so 
Um, what tips do you have for high schoolers or anyone who are who's like trying to find out their career path? Um, I think I think we focus on careers a little too hard. Uh, I think our culture has our culture kind of focuses on like jobs and like the end goal a little too hard, and we forget that um, you know your career is just a part of your life. And um, for me, I think it's important to ask yourself how you want to live rather than exactly what you want to do because you know like what you want to do changes and what you like at this point in our um 2020 lives it's very normal for someone to have seven jobs before they call it a day and retire um it's very normal for someone to hop from being a scuba instructor to a latin dancer to an astronaut who knows um and i think that you know like you're a being a software engineer, being a physiotherapist, for example, it can feel and be and look very, very different depending on who you're working with, who your coworkers are, who the people you're interacting with are, what your schedule looks like, and just what your work environment is. So um, I don't think you should feel stuck in picking a path, but you should figure out how you want to live. For me, how I want to live is I know I want to be on my feet, I know I want to interact with people, and I know I want to live by um, my ethical values and I could do that in literally any career path I could do that in business I could do that in software a little less in software because there's more sitting but it, it could be possible in software I could do that with physio I could do that um, being a gardener or a landscaper or a plumber but um, so like yeah so I'm saying that it's very flexible it's very free but I personally chose um, physiotherapy kinesiology because it ties me with like my what my interests are and for a lot of people you don't know what your interests are and that's completely fine just just know how you like figure out how you want to live and if that changes that's fine too and know that no matter what career path you go with you're you probably will be able to live that way yeah that is amazing advice and I think I think I think so many high schoolers are misled to be like, you know, having that 200k salary, having a beautiful wife, having like a uh, uh, Tesla by uh, 25 or something like that. There's all these like misconceptions that people have of what they think is like a fulfilling career. Yeah. And like if money is genuinely really important to you, like that's fine too. Find a job with a big paycheck if you're happy like that's okay that's fine that's perfectly good just know how you want to live but also know that it's not the only option you know it's not the only way to live your life you started an amazing business venture with your friend can you tell us a bit more about that initiative you were talking about earlier okay so it's called jesse and lucy and basically, it started out um, when I wanted to get all these boob earrings for my housemates. But, you know, um, one pair was $20 and six pairs, because I have six housemates, including me, that would have been $120, and that's not even including tax. So I was like, okay, screw this, I'm going to make them. So I did, and they turned out amazing. And a bunch of my friends were like, oh my god, you should sell it, you should sell it. But because of what I talked about earlier with um, how... You know, I came from a background of a kind of toxic mindset of um, competitive competitiveness and honestly sometimes kind of toxic ambition. I didn't really want to put myself in a position where I could, you know, dive right back in before I was ready to do it in a more healthy way. Um, I was kind of hesitant to um, start this and I also like didn't want to be on social media, I didn't want to do too much marketing. But my friend was like, wait, and this friend is Jesse. She was like, wait, I like marketing. And I was like, okay, let's do it. So it's not a business. Yeah, it's an initiative. And basically, um, the goal of the initiative is to create community responsibility or to like encourage responsibility within the community. Um, and we want, you know, our community members to um, look into issues within the Lulge uh, local or larger community that they care about and kind of give them encourage them to take up the fishing rod to continue um, you know being interested in investing their time into issues within the uh, local and larger community rather than giving them a fish giving you them know a fish. 
that might not make sense right now <laughs> but but basically like we really um so we're we're you know we're like so, sorry there are three ways to participate with us the first way is um we call it share through us so basically you um pick one of our products um, because we just like making artsy things and it's fun. But you pick one of our products, so right now they're boob earrings, prints, and stickers. Uh, and you can give, you can share with us uh, for a minimum donation and we will donate that money for you um, to an organization that we have picked or the community has picked. And we encourage a lot of community participation because we want it to be about everyone. And it's something that everyone cares about. The second way and third way I personally like better um, because it's more hands-on. The second way is share yourself. So you go research the issue you go care about the issue that you want to see helped and you go donate then you can sell us i mean not sell us send us a receipt of your donation you can like block out the donation amount if you want and we'll give you something at cost so it's like a thank you gift and all of our products are called thank you gifts and the third option to participate is you, if you can recommend either yourself or someone else who has done something important in the community because we don't want it to just be all about money and um, to thank them for being um, for you know participating within the community we will also give you a thank you gift at cost um, and I think I think yeah that's that's the idea that's what's happening <laughs> I, I love it. I, I truly, truly love it. I'm definitely going to participate. How does the audience find Jesse and Lucy on socials? Um, so right now we have a Jesse and Lucy Instagram account. It's just Jesse with an I, X, Lucy with an I. Um, that's not our real names, but it, well, we are Jesse and Lucy, but they're not spelled like that. Just, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, so right now we're just on Instagram. I think we're going to start a website. Um, but yeah, it's a. Uh, other than that, it's kind of up in the air right now because we don't want to dive too hard into it um, since, like, we don't want to grind ourselves to the bones. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. but, you know, it's coming. Mm -hmm. I, and we had our photo shoot today. Oh, yeah, it was I, great. I, it was so fun. I saw some, I saw, like, the, yeah, so the pictures that you sent me. They were beautiful. I mean, I want one for myself, yeah. too, so. Yo, I got excited. Thank definitely, you. Definitely, definitely do check them out. Thank you, Lucy, for being on episode three today listening to your story and your journey was very inspiring especially how you know you went from someone who did things that was expected of her and that was put in front of her f by society to someone who was actually realizing what they really liked what was really important to them and what was priority to them i think there's a lot to learn uh, from your journey as well as you talking about virtue signaling and being and having extended compassion so not just about the people around you but also about everyone around the world and being connected to everybody so i really appreciate that and you can definitely check out lucy's socials she's on ig as well as on linkedin everything will be in the description below thank you so much lucy for being on the show thank you for having me i had a great time on to um, our special giveaway that we have right now uh, we have an Amazon giveaway that's going on on Instagram. Uh, the link to that uh, giveaway will be in the description below. And be sure to be up to date with all the latest episodes and stuff that's going on with Capital Interns on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Everything is at Capital Interns, so be sure to follow us there. The next intern on the panel will be a fashion design student who goes to Fashion Institute of Technology in New York and has designed several really beautiful design pieces for big players in the fashion industry. I'm talking about big players. I'm saying it like Donald Trump right now. <laughs> Anyways, stay tuned for a one-on-one -on -one chat as we delve into their career, university life, and high school experience. Till next time. Bye. Bye.